So for that reason, I'm gonna show you this other way of solving the question. It is considerably longer and much more inefficient. But for me, um, it does make sense because I'm like, okay, without you know making this logical leap, how else would we go about this? What other kind of tools do we have at our, at our disposal? We're gonna have to take the scenic route, but it's gonna work, so let me show you. Let's imagine we start back at the beginning part C. How will we go about proving this? Well, I'm going to I'm going to prove this in much the same way that you would prove many other trigonometric identities, which is you're presented with a left-hand side, it's equal to a right-hand side, and you're told, well, uh, what I want you to do is to go from one to the other. Start with the side that's more complicated and see if you can simplify it down to get to something that is simpler. So when you look at the uh, left-hand side and the right-hand side here, which one looks to you like it's more complicated and easier to simplify to get to the other side? I think it's pretty obvious that the right-hand side is more complicated. The left-hand side is like the simple um, sort of version. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that right-hand side. Um, you can see I've rewritten it again in my sort of neater, uh, more succinct C2, C4, C8 notation. And then I think about, well, what can I do with this? Now, you can see why I've pre-written all of this and why it was a method I would, I would like to avoid. This is gonna get messy, right? You've got um, three binomial uh, factors here that are gonna multiply by each other. So it's gonna get a lot messier before it gets uh, better. So here's, here's what happens, right? Um, you can see what I've done on this first line is, um, I have just done just a, a normal expansion. This, this factor here, by this factor here, you get a cos squared, cos theta times cos theta. You get a minus C4 cos theta from doing that pairing here. I'm doing first, last, inside, outside. So that's what you get from um, these two uh, factors here. The cos theta minus C8 that you got from here, unchanged, okay? That one wasn't so bad, but now we have to multiply something with four terms by something with two terms. So in the end, I'm gonna get eight terms. This is gonna be a little bit terrible, but let's stay with it and see what we end up with. I get, here's my eight terms here. Um, I get this is everything in, in the first set of brackets, everything multiplied by cos theta. You can see that's why this become cos cubed. This is a cos squared and this is a cos squared. Uh, and then you have this C2, C4 and a cos theta hanging out at the end. I rinse and repeat, I do exactly the same thing, multiplying every term here, but instead of multiplying by cos theta, I'm multiplying by minus or negative C8. So that's, that's what you get here. Everything here has a C8 on it, as you can see. Okay, so now what do I do with this? How do I tidy this up? Well, I notice there's a bunch of common factors here, right? Um, you can see here, if I uh, highlight, um, there's a bunch of cos squared terms, right? So I've got uh, these cos squared terms, and then I've also got this cos squared term in here. That's helpful. Um, I also have a bunch of cos terms. So I've got uh, cos theta here, uh, and then I've also got some cos thetas there. So you can see, I can actually do a bit of um, sort of collecting of these, I can factorize these terms, um, and I'll get something a little more easy to work with. So here's what happens on the next line. You can see, um, this is me. Uh, I might actually change its color so you can see more clearly. Um, this is me doing these red terms in here that I highlighted above. That they're from the cos squared factorization. Uh, and then in here, this is the blue part. So this is from the cos theta factorization. Okay, so now the question becomes, well, how do I deal with all of this? C2, C4, C8, uh, and then I've also got these, um, this, this weird sort of combination of terms here. Now, when I look at these, I think, oh, this has to do with sum and product of roots, right? I wonder if your brain went to that part of polynomials because you can see here's um, you know, some roots one at a time and here's some roots three at a time. So how do I get to um, using these sum and product of roots results um, in order to uh, evaluate what C2 plus C4 plus C8 is, to evaluate what this awkward term is, okay? What I've got to do is I've got to go back to the last time I had a polynomial that involved these, um, you know, these, these C, C2, C4, and C8 terms. And I actually have to go back a fair way. I'm gonna to have to go all the way back, where is it? Here we go, to z to the nine minus one, which equals this sort of disastrous mess. Now, this is the polynomial I'm after, right? I can take this result here. I know what each of the roots are, and I also know because they're conjugates that when I start to have them interact with each other, a lot of stuff is going to cancel, even though it's gonna look very messy to begin with because you know it's got, it's got nine roots after all. So here's what I've got. I'm going to take that z to the nine minus one, 
that term there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply the sum of roots to it, right? Now remember, I know what all nine roots are. The first one's one. I call them alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Um, and then there are the conjugates of alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Okay, so therefore, the sum of all of them just looks like this. Now you might be wondering, okay, well, if this is the sum of the roots, where, where did this come from? Well, for all polynomials, the sum of roots is minus b on a. That's something you might remember from quadratics, but it's actually true of cubics and quartics and quintics and all of the rest, even up to degree nine. Now, um, the b that we're after is the coefficient of z to the power of eight. But there is no z to the power of eight term, which is another way of saying the coefficient's zero. Um, and then the a, you know what I'm doing here is minus b on a. The a is the coefficient of z to the power of nine. It's the leading coefficient, so that's why I've written it as one. Okay, so um, what I've got is this long uh, expression here on the left hand side, but as we've already seen in this question, because you've got all these conjugates, um, all the imaginary parts are going to cancel out with each other, which will bring me back to these cos 2 pi on 9, cos 4 pi on 9 terms that I'm after. So let's see what happens when I start to expand, uh, or simplify I should say. Um, this, when I add alpha to its conjugate, you just get the real part of alpha, but you get it twice. Same thing with beta, same with gamma, same with delta. When you start to think about, well, what are those real components? It's these cosine terms that I had before, C2, C4, C8. I don't need to do C6 because cos of 6 pi on 9, as we've already seen in this question, is negative a half. So that's, that simplifies out there. And this is marvelous because you can see there's a positive one here, this is going to become negative one. So in fact, this just cancelled out to C, uh, 2C2 plus 2C4 plus 2C8. So thankfully I can just divide everything through by 2 and that gives me this result. So that's fantastic. I can take this and I can substitute it into C2 plus C4 plus C8. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I called this line equation 3. So what I'm going to do is take this, uh, this result here. C2 plus C4 plus C8, and I am going to substitute it into line three, which is the main body of my proof. Okay, so once I do that, this is what you get. You can see the C2, C4, I should say C2 plus C4 plus C8 term, which is the cos squared term, it's just gone, right? It's zero cos squared here, and I get left with all the rest of this stuff, which you can see from before. Okay, so now, where do I go from here, right? Well, I've got to deal with this term in here, this expression, and also uh, this term along the end here. Now at this point you need to pause and take another deep breath, right? How am I going to uh, come up with something that will help here? Um, I could do the same, a similar, I can employ some similar kind of logic and uh, try and think about the sum of roots to, to this guy just like I did before. However, when you take the sum of roots two at a time and three at a time and, you know, in order to get a product of all of these, I'm somehow going to have to take the roots nine at a time, uh, it's actually going to, it's still going to become quite messy. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the result that we proved in part B. Uh, my previous method for solving part C was to start with part B and then go. I haven't used part B in this particular solution method. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call your mind back to what we got from part B. This is just the result from part B, right? Um, it's just stated as, as was required to be proven. And what I want to do is, how do I reshape part B's result in order to get, for example, I just think this one's easier first, how do I get C2, C4, C8 out of this? Like what could I do so that all the rest of this stuff, this Z squared, this Z, this one, I want all of that just to vanish away so that I just get C2, C4, C8, which are already there on the right hand side. I want them to be the only things left. So a little bit, this is a little bit like if you're like sifting flour, you're like, are you trying to pick the right size sieve so that you could just leave the parts that you want, the C2, the C4, and the C8, okay? What I want you to notice is look really hard with this, uh, at this with me, right? Just have a look at this first factor. You can see I've got this z squared here and this plus one. And the only way to get rid of the plus one is to somehow get rid of the z squared at the same time. They're just gonna have to cancel each other out. What value of z squared would make it so that the z squared and the plus one would ex exactly cancel out? Well, what I want is for z squared to equal negative one, right? If z squared were equal to negative one, then you'd have negative one plus one, it would cancel. What value of z will do that? Well, this calls you back to the very first lesson in complex numbers, 
z squared equals negative one, its solution, it's the, the sort of customary solution we arrived at was, was our number i, the square root, the principal square root of negative one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take z equals i and I'm going to substitute it in. So take a deep breath, what have we done here? Every time I saw z, which is a bunch of times on this line, I've replaced it with i. So you can see there's i to the six, i cubed, that one hasn't changed. But then you've got these i squared terms coming in here, which are going to cancel. You can see this i squared and this plus one, they're gonna cancel each other out. This is the genius of it, right? I'm also going to get, you can see on the uh, left-hand side, I know what i to the power of six is, and I know what i cubed is. These real powers of i are very easy to simplify. Um, what do we get? Well, you can see on the next line, i to the power of six um, is gonna be i to the power of four times i squared. And the reason I break it up like that is because i to the power of four, i to the power of four is just one, and we've already pointed out i squared is equal to negative one. So that's why I get this negative one here. You can employ some very similar logic to get the minus i here. Uh, and then it, all of these terms here are going to collapse, right? Negative one plus one, it's all just going to vanish away. So on the next line, you can see what have I got here? Um, this minus one is canceled with this plus one. That's a nice bonus. It leaves me with this minus i on the left hand side. When you have a look at these terms in here, because the minus ones and the plus ones that I've highlighted will cancel, you just get minus 2c2i, uh, minus 2c4i, minus 2c8i. So you've got um, negative two multiplied by itself three times, uh, and then you've got c2, c4, c8. So here's what happens when you multiply the negative twos by each other, negative eight. You've also got the i here, so you've got i cubed. Uh, and so you can see this is going to simplify even further by uh, dividing both sides by i, um, i squared, or multiplying rather, uh, the i squared out, which gets that minus out of the way. And now I'm gonna divide both sides by not just the i, but also the eight. So what have I got here? You can see I have arrived at a value for C2, C4, C8. It's negative an eighth, which might look familiar from a previous question we've tackled before. This is the product of cos two pi on nine, cos four pi on nine, cos eight pi on nine. So in a moment, I'm going to substitute that into here. That'll just become minus, uh, minus negative an eighth. But before I do that, uh, I notice I also have this term buzzing around here, right? C2, C4 plus C4, C8, how, how do I get rid of this? Well, if you think carefully, if you again choose an appropriate value for Z, it's going to make everything collapse on the left and the right hand sides in order to give me exactly this combination of terms. So I'm gonna ask you, if, you're, if you've been following along so far, pause the video at this moment and think about what values of Z might be appropriate that you could substitute into our result from part B that would give you um, exactly the coefficients that I'm after, cos 2 pi on 9 multiplied by cos 4 pi on 9 and all the other combinations. If you've already paused, paused it and come back or you're like, my brain is too fried to be able to do that, uh, let me show you the value of z that will be helpful. It's going to be just z equals 1. Simple, right? What are you going to get? Well, on the left-hand side, you've got, uh, you remember, z to the six, z to the six, z cubed, and one, so they all become one. And then uh, these terms uh, become one, so it doesn't cancel out as neatly as when I chose i, but you can see it's not too bad, right? Um, I've got three on the left-hand side, I've got uh, twos uh, appearing here on the right-hand side, and so I can factor out uh, those those twos out the, the front there, you can see there's, there's three of them, so two cubed. Um, and that leaves me with, when I do this expansion, um, this term here now, or this expression I should say, I keep getting that wrong. Now this expression here should look familiar. You've already done this expression, or you've done this expansion that led to this expression, because this uh, set of three factors is identical to what we had. Let's see if we can find it. Uh, it's identical to what we had here. Do you remember this? Instead of cos thetas though, I have something even simpler. These are just ones in the result that I'm looking at. So that's why this result looks so familiar and that's why it's also so useful to us, right? So um, as I go further, you can see um, I am number one. I'm gathering together these terms here because they're actually terms that I already know the value of. Uh, and it's the same with these terms on the hit and here. I already evaluated C2, C4, C8 um, just earlier on. So I know that it's equal to negative an eighth, and I also know that this is just equal to zero, so it just vanishes away. 
So I'm really close now, right? You can see I've successfully gotten rid of all my other cos 2 pi on 9, cos 4 pi on 9 terms. All I have is these paired up ones. So all I need to do is just um, simplify a little bit and uh, make this expression the subject. So let's watch it happen. Uh, you can see here um, that this is just uh, plus an eighth. So one plus an eighth is nine eighths. And then I just need to, uh, to get this by itself. I need to subtract nine eighths from both sides. So just be careful with your signs here because three take away nine is negative six. But of course you can simplify that further to be negative three quarters. <sighs> so believe it or not, we are pretty much there. I can go back to the last time I was in the main body of my argument, which was this line here, uh, C4 right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, this, it's the right hand side equals this, except now I know what the value of this is. It's, uh, I think it's negative three quarters or three quarters, we'll see down the bottom. Uh, and this guy here is just negative an eighth. So let's go down and do that. So I'm going to paste that in. The right hand side is that, but it's equal to eight times cos cubed theta. This we just uh, did the, uh, we just evaluated that, so that's negative three quarters, negative three quarters times cos theta. Uh, and then the, along the end here, we've got minus, and then this is negative an eighth. And then I close my brackets. Uh, in fact, I should draw those as big square brackets so it's a bit clearer, like so. Okay, this is looking promising. Uh, what have I got here? Well, um, I'm actually gonna multiply through by eight because that's going to deal with the fractions that I have here. Um, that gives me eight cos cubed out the front. Um, when you multiply this by this, the, uh, the fours will cancel, leaving you with a two there. Two times negative three is minus six cos theta. And then um, these two negatives cancel and then eight times an eighth is just going to be one. Now we've proved this before when we were first introduced to De Moivre's theorem. Uh, this guy here is just the real component of what happens when you expand out cos theta plus i sine theta all cubed. This is the result that you end up getting. So therefore I can say that this is actually equal to um, two lots of four cos cubed minus three cos theta. That's actually the part that I was saying from Pascal's triangle, from your binomial coefficients. And that therefore by definition, um, or by our proof of earlier on is two cos three theta. It's the triple angle result plus one. Believe it or not, that is the required result. Because remember, it was on the left-hand side of our original equation. We started on the right-hand side and miraculously we've ended there. So, Conclusion, uh, this is a mountain of a problem. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I don't think that the authors of this question intended for us to go this very, very long path to get there. But you can see without having made that logical leap that we saw in our first proof of just taking the values that sit on the unit circle, um, this was a way that worked and hopefully you were able to follow the logic. It was mostly just the algebra um, that you had to be very patient and persevere with.